Welcome to some Punnett square practice. Now we've talked a lot about Mendel, how we understood that there's two of each allele per organism. We know that's because we're diploid now. We have two chromosome sets. We've talked about genes versus alleles and how you only pass on one allele for each pair, right? We just said we have two of everything. We only pass on one via meiosis to our offspring. So we then want to take the next step, which is predicting based upon the genes that the parents have, we call that the genotypes, the two alleles you possess, we want to predict what the offspring are likely to have, either phenotypically what they look like or genotypically what their actual alleles are. So for this, I want to make sure that we're comfortable and that you guys understand how to set these up so that you can use Punnett squares to calculate the probability that offspring will have specific phenotypes or genotypes. So starting off, we're going to assume that we've got a pea plant, we're going to go with Mendel's theme, and we've got yellow pods and we've got green pods. Now we're going to assume for our case that green is dominant because it is. So what we need to do here is figure out what are the genotypes of the parents involved. So if you have yellow pods and that's recessive, it means you must be homozygous recessive. So in that case, one of the parents has to be little g, little g. And that individual is crossed with someone who's heterozygous, so big G little g. So this is our parents. This is what we first need to have. Now, because we're just looking at one trait, pod color, we can set up the fairly straightforward Punnett square. They don't have to be drawn fancy, as you can see. Uh, and then we're going to fill in each parent. Now, what these sides represent is possible gametes. So for this first parent, they can pass on either their first g, which is a little g, or their second, because they only pass on one or the other to their egg, sperm, their sex cells. The other parent has a big G and a little g. So it can either pass on the big G via the sex cells or the little g. So these are now one parent's possible gametes and the other parent's possible gametes. We then just kind of line them up and fill them in. So we've got a big G here, so I'm going to write that in both of these things below it, because that's how you do it. Do the same thing for this one, little g, little g. You then go across. So in this case, we're going to put a little g there, little g there, this little g goes here, this little g goes here. So you just grid it in. Now, once we've got this, we now have the possible genotypes of the offspring. In this case, two out of four offspring are going to be big G, little g, and two out of four of the offspring are going to be little g, little g. So this will allow us to now make our final observations. So phenotypically, how many will have green pods? Well, anyone with at least one big G has green pots. So in this case, this group will. So two out of four will have it, or 50% if you prefer. Put a comma there. Yellow pods would be these guys. So ultimately, that will also be two out of four, or 50% as well. So in terms of phenotype, it's 50-50. Now for genotype, we have zero individuals that will be big G, big G, so we'll just say 0%. For big G, little g, that'll be 2 out of 4 or 50%. And for this one, it'll also be 50%. Now, there's different ways you can write this. Like for the genotype, for instance, you can also write 0 to 2 to 2, where you typically do homozygous dominant, heterozygote, homozygous recessive. So you work your way from the most dominant to the most recessive genotypes. Uh, you can also write the same thing for phenotypes, where you do dominant, to recessive, so two to two. So four total, two are green, two are yellow. Now for the next one, we've got two pea plants, heterozygous for the round pea trait. So this means both of them will be heterozygotes. Round is gonna be a dominant trait, so we're gonna go through and use big R for round. That way it's just the kind of norm that if round is dominant, you pick the first letter of it and make it uppercase to show it's dominant. So this is our cross, this guy with this guy. We then set up. Our same scenario, fill in the possible gametes, right? This can pass on the big R or the little r. This one can do the same. I like to put the dominants always up top. You don't have to. You could put them in either place. That's just what I do. Uh, and then you start to fill in the grid. You'll notice when I fill in my grids, I also, if there is a big R and a little r, I always put the big R first. Now this isn't necessary, but I like to do this because it means I can look at that first letter of the genotype and know instantly if it's dominant or recessive. Because any time it has even a single dominant, it'll be the first guy. If they don't have it, then ultimately if the first guy is a little r, I know immediately that that one's going to be a recessive phenotype.
If you were to write it like this, you would have to look at both before you could figure this out. So it would just take you a little bit longer to sort this out. The way I do it just basically makes it take me no longer to start, but it saves me time at the end. It makes it a little bit easier for me at the end. So at this point, you can go through, and so we can look at our phenotype, which is going to be what they're going to look like. So in this case, phenotype is going to be round or wrinkled, and you can see my writing is amazing. Uh, and so for round, we're going to see that we have three out of four individuals, or 75%, have at least one big R. Boom, boom, boom. We have one individual, this is that famous F2 that Mendel got, where in the F2 generation it was a 3 to 1 ratio, phenotypically, where there was that little bit of the recessive that popped back up, 25%. And that's what we see here, 75% to 25%, or you can write that 3 to 1, 3 dominance to 1 recessive. Now, genotypically, this one's interesting, where you can see that genotype and phenotype ratios are not the same. So, for instance, genotypically, we have one individual that's big R, big R. We have two individuals that are big R, little r, and one individual that's little r, little r. So, if we were to look at our ratio genotypically, it's going to be one to two to one. So, if I give you this problem, you're going to tell me phenotypically it's a three to one ratio, three dominance, one recessive. But if I say for the exact same problem, I want the genotypic ratio, that ratio is going to be one to two to one. This is why it's very important you understand the difference between phenotype, what they look like, and genotype, what their pair of alleles are. And then you need to make sure you give me the appropriate ratio because it will not always be the same. You can't just assume if it's two to two for one, it'll be two to two for the other. Now to try one more, just to make sure you guys are getting this down, uh, in this case I gave you what they were, I'm not going to make you sort it out, I'm just telling you this is going to be a big Y, big Y crossed with a big Y, little y. Uh, so what we're going to do here then is just set up the Punnett square like we've been doing. And once again, we can have a big Y or a big Y, so I'm just going to do that one first, so big Y, big Y. Over on the side, I've got a big Y or a little y. And you'll notice for my little y, I try to make it where it's down lower, so that way there's empty space up top, which does not exist with these other ones, to try to make it obvious that it's a little y. When you get to some of these letters that aren't as simple to decide if they're upper or lowercase, you've got to make sure you exaggerate it. So when I look at the problem, I can tell, you can tell if it's you know an uppercase y or a lowercase y, or an uppercase w or a lowercase w. At that point, you just got to fill it in. This one's not too tough. And then we're going to get our final answers now. So if I'm looking phenotypically, which I'll just abbreviate here, uh, we're going to have where yellow is dominant. And so in this case, the yellows are going to be 100%. Every single guy has at least one big Y. So if I'm asking for phenotypic ratios, this is going to be 1 to 0. You know, it's going to be 100%, 4 out of 4. If I'm asking genotypically, though, this is going to be another one of those that's going to be odd because we do have where there's going to be two individuals that are homozygous dominant. So you could also write that HD. Uh, and so that will be two out of four, or that will be 50%. And then we will have two individuals that are heterozygous. And so if we're looking at this now, you'll commonly see that this might be given as a one to one ratio, or if you're including the other ones where there's none of, you might add a to zero in here. Uh, you could also write this as two to two, or two to two to zero. It really doesn't make a difference. It could be 100 to 100 to 0, but the idea is it's 50-50. There's none of them that are ultimately homozygous recessive. So you can see yet again there's a difference between our phenotypic ratio, 100%, and our genotypic ratio, which is 50-50, and then 0 if we include the guy that's not there, which is good old little y, little y. Now for my final cross, I want to show you a dihybrid cross. Because some of what Mendel did, if you remember, with the law of independent assortment, where he saw that one characteristic, one gene, what you inherit for it doesn't affect what you get for the next gene. And so we want to make sure that you're aware of how to do dihybrid crosses. So for a dihybrid cross, you have to avoid what your body wants you to do, it seems like. Whenever I give these to people, they kind of write them out, and right away they're like, boom, you know, I got this. I know how to do these things. I know how to set them up. And so they start to just write like big T, little t, big G, little g, ha ha, look, I'm a g. No, you're not a genius. Because we have to give one of the t's, right? We have to give either big T or little t. That's what we did last time. So each gamete needs one t and one G. 
So what you need to do is essentially what happens when you FOIL in math. So if you remember from math, when they give you problems, you had to go first, outer, inner, L. Don't know what the heck that means. I'm not a math person, all right? Uh, I think it's last. But So what you end up doing is you say, okay, I could use this big T. That's what I could give. So I'm going to do for two of my possible gametes, I'm going to say, let's assume I give the big T. Now that big T could also be packaged with the big G because they don't affect one another. So what you get for one doesn't impact what you get for the other. I could also give a big T and a little g. So I'll do that as my next possible gamete. I then can use the little t instead, and the little t can go with the big G. So little t, big G. Or I can have the little t with a little g. So these are my possible gametes. And you can tell you've done it right, typically, if each one has one of each type of gene, so a T and a G. Or if we were using A's and B's, you'd need one A and one B. I don't care if they're upper or lower case. That depends on what they gave you. Now, for this next one, you'll see it's pretty easy, because you're going to give a little T, little G, little T, little G, little T. It's always going to be a little T, and it's always going to be paired up with a little G because they're homozygous for each. So there really isn't any other option other than to just get these. So then you'd fill that in. And then at this point, you just have to go through and fill in stuff like we did before. Now, I use my normal method, where because this one's a big T and a little t, I always put the dominant one first, because that makes it easier for me to read. Same thing for the Gs. I'm going to go through and fill it in like this. So I'll go fill in a couple. So now that I've filled in the first row, you can go look at this and see. This individual is going to be tall with green pods. This individual is going to be tall with yellow pods. This individual is going to be short with green pods. This individual is going to be short with yellow pods. So we can start to analyze the phenotypes, which is what I'm going to be asking you. So here's the way I start to break this down, and I'll actually show you kind of a shortcut way to fill this out. So I want to know how many individuals are tall with green pods. That's one possible phenotype. The other phenotypes you can have are short with green pods tall with yellow pods, or the long shot to be short with yellow pods, recessive for both. So what I can actually do here to save time is because I'm not going to ask you for genotypes, you should be able to fill in these blocks. So if I give you a chart like this, I could tell you, like, explain to me what this would look like. And so you can go through and you can fill it in and say big T, little t, little g, little g. So you should know how to fill in that. But ultimately, I'm typically just going to ask you for phenotypes if it's a dihybrid. So one of my shortcuts I tend to do is just look to see if it'll be dominant for each trait or recessive. And I just put one letter down. So for instance, this is big T, little t. It's going to be tall. So I'll just put T for tall. Big G, little g is still going to be green. So I'm just going to put a G for green. When I go over here to the next group, it's going to be big T, so it's going to be tall. I don't see any big Gs, so I'm going to put a little g so I know it's tall and yellow. And so you can do this to kind of just simplify it so that way when you're reading it, if all they're asking you for is the phenotypes, you can just read the phenotype a lot faster. So this is not absolutely necessary. You, don't, you can still do it like the long form way. Uh, this is just something that I tend to prefer. And if you notice, because everybody here on the left hand side is the same, each column is exactly the same. So it starts to become pretty easy where this whole column, all four of these guys, are going to be tall and green. All four of these guys are going to be tall and yellow. And so over here, we should be able to figure out it's going to be 4 to 4 to 4 to 4. That's going to be the phenotypic ratios I'd get for this particular cross. 